The lengths to which a person will go to prevent their death are common tropes in storytelling. There are even common tropes in the universe of Fallout as well. We saw this in our last video with Vault 118. We saw it with Eddie Winters and the Cabots, with Big MT and Robert House. Inevitably, death is something that science always seems to take a run at. Well, it wouldn't be a Fallout DLC if at least one person didn't try and cheat it. And our topic of today's video is just that. John Caleb Bradburton, the enigmatic creator of New Coca-Cola and Project Cobalt, the mysterious R&D project that has come up in many of our videos covering this theme park. We did cover some of the details about it in the World of Refreshment video I did a year ago. However, the motivations for why it was even started to begin with were always a bit of a mystery, as were why so many of the park's resources were devoted to it. Today, we'll get the answer to the real reason it was created, as it's been so long. I'll also recap the story of the beverage years in the World of Refreshment, or at least the parts relevant to this story. If you enjoy this video, please leave a like and a comment as it helps performance, and click the bell icon so you don't miss future videos. Now, let's get into the final mystery of Nuka World. When we first arrive at the park and enter the town, we come across a woman called Sierra Petrovita. Now before we get any further, I want to clear up a few things. Yes, she is actually a character from Fallout 3. Yes, she was mental for Cola, even back then. However, she isn't the focus of this video, so beyond her role in this quest, we won't be covering her. Maybe a video for another time. She is the one that first sets us out on our quest that takes us to every part of the park. Before the war, there was a competition. This competition required guests to wear a special pair of glasses that allowed them to decipher a series of clues hidden on copies throughout the park. If you get all the clues, you could take them to John Caleb Bradburton's office, key them in, and gain entry, and talk to the Big Cheese himself. As we shall see later, this would actually present issues, given what he did to himself. But for now, we just need the clues. You can skip ahead if you'd like, as beyond giving the code for the door, these hints don't add anything to the lore. She gives us a total of 10 hints, hints that I definitely didn't forget about and instead use the local map on the Pip-Boy, the marker for which disappears when you get too close. We can assume she got them from a certain document we find later, which we'll get to. Honestly, using that would be less trouble than looking them up separately in the Pip-Boy every time. The first you want to get can be found beside the fountain outside the Fizz Top Grill. It's next to a building that can be found behind a large tree. After this one, you can head to the World of Refreshment. Here, if you go to the Wild West section, you can find another one on the side of a building beside a cactus. Next are the ones in the other parks, each of which contains two. In Galactic Zone, the first of them is found beside the gate to the employee area, around the left hand side of the Star Control, as you're facing it. The other one is up the ramp to the left of the Robco Battle Zone. After reaching the top of it, keep right, and you can find it beside a pair of trash cans. The first one in Kitty Kingdom is located in the large tower just before King Cola's castle. If you go all the way to the top, it's located right at the top of the stairs. The other one is located inside the funhouse. At the very end of it is a spinning room with doors along its circumference. Only one leads out of the building. The door two from the left of this one has the copy inside of it. The first one in Safari Adventure is located at the Primate House. As you approach the doors, on the right is a gap in the hedge. Go into it and the copy will be on the back of the gorilla statue located here. The next one can be found in the maze if you stick to the path to the right. You'll reach a dead end and the copy will be on the wall directly opposite you. Lastly are the two in Dry Rock Gulch. The first is located at the back of a grave that, given what we know of this park, probably contains the body of an employee as opposed to being fake. The last one you need is located in Mad Mulligan's Mine, on the side of a metal shed as you walk through the ride. So not particularly out of the way, to be honest. Now, let's get back to the story. The reason that Sierra wants them is that she is obsessed with the formula for Nuka Cola. She suspects that if anyone has information on the flavor, it will be the creator himself, Brad Burton. Hence her petitioning various people, us included, to get the clues for her. We won't get into why she just doesn't break in, as uh, the door looks like a swift boot would sort it. Unless, of course, it's reinforced to fuck. After we collect them all, we can return to her and have this conversation. Happy hunting! I found all the hidden cappies. Each one had a letter? Great. Let me take a look at these letters. 
Well, anyone who stared at Nuka Cola merchandise as long as I have would get this one pretty fast. The letters definitely spell refreshing. It's simpler than I was expecting. So how do we use this code? This door should lead to Brad Burton's office, but it's locked up tight. The keypad is the only way to open it. I guess we just need to key in the 10 numbers that correspond to the word refreshing. You did all the work looking for the hidden copies, so you should be the one who gets to enter the code. Hi, Sierra. That's it! The door's unlocked! Let's go inside! Let's search carefully. I'm willing to bet this place has a few secrets. And they'll probably be well hidden. Hey, Sierra. The formula would be hidden somewhere. No way Brad Burton would leave it out in the open. So, a fairly simple code in the end. And honestly, given it was limited to only 10 numbers, and given the clues, I don't know how she didn't just try a bunch over the years, as there doesn't seem to be any penalty in place for wrong guesses. When we get inside, she wants us to search everything and, to be honest, there isn't really much to search through. The downstairs is fairly sparse, nothing seems to be left of the reception area, and the rest of the place is falling apart. Oddly enough, all the windows and exits are boarded up and sealed. Given no one has supposedly been here in centuries, and given what we learn about Brad Burton, this is a little odd. It could be Peyton Huxley, Brad Burton's right hand, but given the whole park was shut down by Brad Burton, I find it hard to believe that they came back here just to board everything up and then run away again. Then again, we have seen Stranger. Now there is actually quite a lot to unpack on his terminal entries here and the ones we find later in a certain hidden location. The title likely gives it away, but we'll find it pretty soon. However, before all of that, I want to take a look at this holotape that gives us some information about the unreleased clear flavor. In regards to Nuka-Cola Clear Production, I think it's obvious that we need to take a step back and examine the facts. Project Cobalt dropped Quantum in our laps, so I think it's best we leverage its potential popularity before someone else beats us to market. Additionally, installing the equipment to produce both flavors would cost us a pretty penny, and I'd rather use the funds to promote Quantum. We also have our lemon lime flavor debuting soon, and need to work out how to market two clear colored flavors simultaneously. With all these factors taken into account, I have no choice but to hold off Nuka Cola Clear production for at least the next two fiscal years. So there we have it. Given we know Quantum came out just before the bombs dropped, this holotape was recorded sometime just before then. The release of Clear was postponed as it would have detracted from both the marketing of Quantum and some lemon lime flavored drink as well. This explains why it was never released, as the world burned down shortly after this. The holotape does raise a few questions, however. He says he doesn't want someone else to beat them to market regarding Quantum. Given what we learned regarding its creation in the World of Refreshment video, I really don't see how this is possible, as it was a byproduct of some incredibly advanced weapons research and I really don't see how another soft drinks manufacturer could manage the same. I also don't see how Clear would have required additional equipment over the existing flavors, as Quantum was really the only one with incredibly exotic materials in it, at least in comparison to the other flavors. Underneath the holotape, we can find a guide to all the hidden copies. This was the document I assume Sierra collected the copy hints from. Now, it's actually really odd to me that this is the only copy we can find. Throughout the park, we come across a lot of bodies, and many of them have notes on them, tickets for the park, and also maps. So this being the only physical copy is odd. I wonder if, due to what Brad Burton was going to have done to himself, did he scrap the guide so the hunt would be a lot more difficult? That way, he wouldn't have to deal with as many park goers, or possibly any at all. Apart from the scarcity of this document, the only other evidence we have of this comes later, with him wanting to stay out of the spotlight. Additionally, given what we find here in the office, at a certain point, Letting just anyone come in here and wander around wouldn't be a good idea, 
lest they discover what he did to himself. Now it's time to take a look at his terminal, and it gives us a lot of information. Honestly, due to the volume of terminal entries here, I think I'll also give some footage of the corresponding park areas in the actual video, as this gives us the reasons for some of the issues we saw when we explored the other sections. What we can immediately see is that each of the parks is closed, which explains the lockdown that we see in pretty much every part, with a stripping back of the various pieces of functionality. When we look at the meal system, we can begin to see his correspondences with various people in the park, some of whom we have come across when we've explored the other regions. The first tells us immediately that, as in all things, Voltec had their hands in this. It's addressed to a Giles Mainsgrove from Voltec Special Projects. Radburton thanks him for the work he did on his private sanctuary, which, let's be honest, is 100% a vault of some sort. They apparently installed a control switch for Bradburton, which he says he placed on his greatest creation. The first entry is a clue you need when exploring his office, as I'll show later. The last line about money being wired to Giles accounts got me thinking though, was this an approved project from vault -Tec? Or did Brad Burton enlist this individual on the sly to construct the vault? It could be just the phrasing, but it sounds like the money wasn't paid to vault -Tec, but to this individual themselves. So it may be a possibility that this vault of Brad Burton's was even off of the official vault -Tec books. Given the Galactic Zone literally allowed vault -Tec the chance to experiment on the park residents, this vault may have been part of that deal. The next entry is to Brad Burton from Peyton Huxley themselves, the right hand of Brad Burton in the park. They've had to clear his entire schedule for the next half a year, and for now, this has left a mystery to us. They mention the transfer of medical records, and someone named Braxton, who we should get to later. Whatever it is they wanted to do themselves, it will prevent them from interacting with the public, and given the mention of medical records, it must be related. Peyton believes this will be a loss for the company overall, but I have my doubts about this, given who carried out the actual research on Quantum, and what we learn later about some of the flavours the company's developed, but we'll get to that. The next entry is from Brad Burton to Peyton Huxley, and it's about Galactic Zone. It seems that someone was listening to the staff there, and keeping an eye on the growing amount of accidents. Due to this, Peyton recommended they close Galactic Zone, so a much needed overhaul of Star Control and the robots there could take place. You may be a little confused by the need for this, so we'll have to talk about Galactic Zone again, briefly. To get the whole story, I recommend the video I made on Galactic Zone about 5 months ago. If not, we'll just cover the cliff notes. Galactic Zone was marketed as a futuristic part of the park. It was staffed almost entirely by robots, and all of them were controlled by something called Star Control. Star Control was a control system composed of many redundant cores, so if one failed or was removed, the others would be there to take its place. However, Due to the age of many of the robots, and the large volume of them, even this state-of-the-art system was beginning to struggle. This presented itself in many of the robots suffering malfunctions, with the results sometimes being injury to the park goers and the staff. The staff didn't have the resources or the manpower needed to maintain the park anymore. Moreover, all of this was heading to a real malfunction of the robots here. We also finally get an answer as to why the robots were armed in the first place and why a defense protocol was built into Star Control. Brad Burton wanted to use them to defend the park. He also mentions they had to cooperate with Robco to get the weaponry in the first place. I find this a little odd, as most of the models we see there, uh, the sentry bots and assault drones excluded, have either the same weaponry found elsewhere, or the weaponry utilizes quantum. Centuries later, the load the system was placed under did become a problem, as, when too many of the cores were removed, it malfunctioned. When the defense protocols were enabled, Due to the load the system was under with the amount of robots, and the remaining cores being inadequate, the emergency mode was enabled. This prevented any changes to the commands, and as a result, the defensive protocol caused the deaths of all the settlers in the park. Given the cooperating with Robco line, and the defense mode hadn't been tested, going off of what we learn in Galactic Zone, I wonder just how experimental this system really was, and whether Brad Burton hadn't just agreed solely so we could get access to military-grade technology which is something he actually does quite a bit. All that aside, all he said was it needed to be fixed, and it had to be done without closing Galactic Zone. The next entry is in regards to the incident with AFAD in Safari Adventure. To recap, AFAD was an animal rights activist group that opposed the experimentation and conditions the animals were kept in, and LB Shelton is complaining that they don't have enough resources to deal with them. At the time, the group was just harassing people at the park and stealing snakes, as you do. 
However, this culminated in kidnapping Dr. Hine, and when the bombs were dropped, he was killed. The reason for the understaffing was due to Project Cobalt, which we shall go over again very soon. However, due to the demands of the project, 12 of the security staff at Savaria Venture were put onto it, and as a result, AFAD, as incompetent as they seemed to be, were actually able to repeatedly break into the park. A lot more went on here, like in Galactic Zone, so if you want the full story, I have a video on Safari Adventure, as well. After this, we get some information about the Hidden Cappy contest. Apparently, he would indeed have to receive every single winner of it. How many this ended up being, we don't know, as the runtime of the contest before the bombs hit is unknown. However, for a man like Brad Burton, I find it surprising he would even tolerate it at all. When we learn exactly what Project Cobalt was, it's actually pretty funny when you think about it. Honestly, if he had still received them afterwards, I think it would have been even better. Just keep in mind that line about transfer. The end of the entry also suggests that he and Peyton got on quite well, likely due to how much they did for him and the amount of time they'd spent working together. The last piece of meal is from someone who should be quite familiar to you, and if not, go check out the World of Refreshment video. I'll be recapping what happened there anyway, so if you don't want to watch the whole video, just wait a little longer. Kate Levitt was one of the Beverageers, a group of organic chemists that worked on the various products that the corporation produced. As we'll soon discuss, they were all folded into a top secret program called Project Cobalt, and began working on enhancements to military weaponry using quantum. Quantum was a substance they created, using the mentioned strontium-90 in this terminal entry. Due to its radioactive nature, it gave off a blue glow, and this was very attractive as an additive to the existing line of colas. However, Kate always had misgivings about the weapons research and the ethics of it, and that it extended into the limited testing here. It seems that they never did proper product testing, and as a result, are unsure of the long-term effects of quantum. I mean, if your piss is causing bathroom lighting to be redundant, Jesus only knows what it's doing to your insides. She wants 6 to 8 months to run some tests. Now, as far as we know, this delay never happened, as the time between the conception of quantum and the release of it to market was much shorter than this. But again, I'll go over the beverage year story soon, when the reason for the context becomes clear. The last entry highlights again why Brad Burton felt Peyton was so indispensable. He sent some condolence letters to the testers of the earlier iterations of the quantum flavor, testers that are, apparently, dead now, showing that Kate's request to hold off on releasing it was probably a really good idea. The underhanded nature of Peyton is also demonstrated with the waivers they apparently snuck into the contracts the testers signed. However, I wonder if this wouldn't just be standard in any tester's contract? Then again, perhaps for something as innocent as a soft drink, it shouldn't be making it into the testing phase if death is on the cards. Brad Burton suggests that he sees Peyton as his possible successor, and rewards him with a quantum blue Corvega, which sounds fucking awful, but hey, free car. Now the only other thing to see in his office, apart from the entrance to the secret vault, which we'll get to in a minute, is his safe. You do get the key later, but I feel like the hollow tip here gives a lot of context for what we'll see later, whilst not spoiling it too much. So we'll have a listen to this conversation with General Braxton that was the beginning of Brad Burton and the Beverage Year's involvement with Project Cobalt. Look, Brad Burton, I didn't fly down from DC to get jerked around. You either sign off on Project Cobalt or I can walk right out that door. This isn't like deciding what color bottle to pick for our next flavor, General. You're asking me to take my laboratories and my beverage years and basically turn them over to your team. I need assurances that my people and my facilities are going to be treated with the respect that they deserve. You and I both know that's a load of horseshit. Stop treating me like one of your soft drink competitors. I'm here representing the U.S. military. I already told you you'd be well compensated. Now cut the crap and tell me what you're really after. Fine. I want in on the military sleep X program. What? I I could have been How the hell did you know about that? You know, Let's just say you're, you're not the only one in this room that can throw his weight around in Washington, General. I've been following the program ever since its inception, and I have to say that I'm impressed. The ability to keep a human in a state of veritable immortality using a machine. Now that's something that I didn't Whoa. expect from the military. This is amazing. Look, 
you want me to agree to this proposal, then get me on the Leap X list, and I'll sign whatever you want. I always knew you were a greedy son of a bitch, John. But the last thing I expected to hear is that you were afraid of death. If you know so much about Leap X, then you know it's in its infancy, and there are a lot of kinks to be worked out. It isn't as easy as throwing a switch and suddenly you can live forever. Stop trying to talk me out of it. We both know the enemy is developing chemical and biological weapons, and that my beverage ears are the top organic chemists in the world. Our countries are in a race where no one comes in second to general. So you need to ask yourself, can you really afford to stand here and say no? You had this all figured out before I even arrived, didn't you? Okay, fine. You want in on the Leapex program? This you got yourself a deal. through history. You know, maybe immortality is what's best for you, Brad Burton. Be a goddamn shame to let that ego go to waste. So this conversation was a negotiation between Braxton and Brad Burton regarding Brad Burton giving Braxton access to his research on technology for Project Cobalt. Braxton seems to know Brad Burton well enough to know he's talking shit when he voices concern for about how his people and facilities will be treated. Really, he doesn't seem to care and just wants something for himself. Also, just keep that line about soft drinks competitors in the back of your mind. It comes up again later. Braxton wanted in on something called LeapX, a secret military program. Secret enough that even Braxton Knowing who Brad Burton is and the power he wields, was shocked that he knew about it. That he knew about it since it began suggests some very powerful connections in DC, which is likely why they looked at him to begin with. It's apparently some sort of immortality based technology. If I'm being honest, this is the dumbest thing Brad Burton says. What does he mean he didn't expect immortality based research from the military, unless he's being sarcastic? That would be something I'd 100% expect them to be researching. Honestly, given how many individuals we've encountered over the years that have done just that using various paths of science, like ghoulification, life support, and three different versions, as far as I can recall, of stick your brain in a robot, they're bound to have their fingers in some of those pies. But we'll get to those details later. He talks about there being a list which makes it sound more like they were getting donors to fund it as opposed to test subjects. Which, who knows, maybe they were. Braxton then makes a pretty transparent attempt to talk him out of it, or seems to, but as we'll see later, this may not be what it seems. Also, I think his comment about his beverage years being the top organic chemists in the world is a bit of an exaggeration. They make soft drinks. Now I'll admit I know little about that, so someone who does, feel free to correct me. But I find it very unlikely that there aren't far more advanced avenues of R&D in the field of organic chemistry that the military is already involved in, and as such would already have capable researchers to draw on. Now before we continue deeper into the mystery of Brad Burton and Leapex, I want to go off a little here. Not on a tangent, as Project Cobalt is heavily related to this story. Just a little detour to recap a story we covered a little over a year ago. A story that took place underneath the world of refreshment, where its darkness could be hidden away from the world. Now if you'd like to just go and watch the full story on that, I recommend you do that now, and either skip this section or come back to it. Alternatively, you can just use the timestamps to skip ahead if you'd rather not hear the story of Project Cobalt, or at least what was told to us regarding to it in the world of refreshment. I won't be covering the whole of the story, as that would be too much just for a recap. When we entered the bottling plant itself, we came across a last stand against the Meyer lurks conducted by the gunners. Behind them is a locked door that, after restoring power to the park, we can get through, taking an elevator down to the beverage years lab. Here we can find the place they both worked and lived in, and we can unravel and piece together what happened to the team down here. The main story is given to us in the form of terminal entries and some holotapes that were secretly recording the staff here before Kate Levitt exposed it, along with Kate, who's called Ruth in one terminal entry for some reason. The other three researchers were Rex Meacham, Edmund Medford, and Kevin Bennell. The terminal entries are divided up into two sections, research logs and user logs. The part of the research logs that interest us are the ones regarding Q4N7, which was the quantum compound they had worked on and designed. It was derived from strontium-90, which you might remember from Kate's message that we found on Brad Burton's terminal. It was the stable compound they wanted to use to enhance weaponry, specifically nukes, 
and had the bluish glow we're all so familiar with, as it was what was added to the existing formula to create the quantum flavor. The user logs here chronicle the research that was carried out, from conception before the bombs dropped, to the conclusions after. The facility under the world of refreshment didn't exist before the project began, and the equipment they got access to was top of the line. It is here that we first learn that Kate Levitt wasn't happy with the direction the research was going in. A holotape confirms that Rex Meachin put them all in the project, and appears that, initially, the details of its true purpose, making weapons, was kept from them. She eventually found out, and from here, the relationship between the two of them began to deteriorate. During their testing, they found a way to create a relatively safe additive that, when added to the drinks, gave it the bluish glow that was so important to the marketing campaign. The new drink, Quantum, was then used to keep Kate occupied. However, the log that details the testing reveals that Kate's message to Bradburton was very warranted. Even after all the testing, what they settled on still had several side effects and caused dizziness, and this was still likely only in the short term. Since it happened in DC, and Kate was, at that point, being kept out of the loop of that side of the research, it's not unreasonable to assume she may not have been aware of the deaths it was causing. I say this as it seems like something she'd have brought up in her correspondences, so even at this point in time, things were being hidden from team members. These deaths were likely the ones the company avoided liability for due to Peyton's inclusion of the waivers in the contracts. One of the last entries before the post-war ones make a reference to Brad Burton's health, and given the other entries on his terminal, it could have been that he'd undergone whatever procedure he needed to at that point. However, as I'll talk about later, this may not have actually been the case. Due to the mention of the testing for Quantum being done as well, this also means this was done just before the bombs were dropped. As such, the timeline between creation to market of Quantum was very short, and the long-term effects were almost certainly not tested, despite Kate's warnings. We'll get a proper timeline later on. Now the rest of the story of the beverage years involves some of the recordings Rex secretly made of the rest of the team, along with a few bodies, a note and some more context from the terminal entries. To keep it brief, after the bombs were dropped, Brad Burton, or someone else in the park, hit the button to initiate the park-wide lockdown. This caused the beverage years to get locked in their lab. From here, things rapidly deteriorated, with Medver taking their own life, Rex killing kids, and eventually Kevin as well. He became obsessed that their work was going to save America, and that if they left, the enemy would get them. This obsession, as I pointed out then, and in my Galactic Zone video, was very odd to me. I say this because we already find ordnance in the park that incorporates quantum. It's a little odd that he felt the need to continue, given that it had already achieved success, as we shall see. Yes, some of it was still in the prototype stage, but it wasn't so underdeveloped that he had to throw himself into it as much as he did. Likely, as we discussed in the video on them, he suffered a bit of a breakdown, and the research became a lifeline. You can watch my video on them if you want the full story. Now, back to Brad Burton. His greatest creation is obviously the cola. Going over to the vending machine, we can find a button that opens up the bookcase on the wall opposite. Behind it, we can enter an elevator that takes us underneath his office. Here, when we step out, we are immediately greeted with the sight of a vault door. Though unlike many that we see, such as Vault 118 that we just took a look at, it's open. Additionally, a lot of construction equipment is still here, suggesting that the entry regarding its completion was fairly close to the bombs dropping. Given some of the entries that we find later, it's likely it was finished just a year or so before the bombs hit. That so much equipment was left over is, in my opinion, likely more to do with the resources the vault needed later on, related to Leapex. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Inside, there isn't much to see, as this was a vault for one, and apart from the room we shall soon look at, we can find nothing else in here. No uniforms, no overseer, though technically you could argue the one resident here is the overseer. Now due to the positive response I got on the Vault 118 video in regards to dialogue, I will be keeping in the entire exchange between us, Sierra, and the residents of this vault, though I'm sure you've worked out who it is already. If you'd like to skip this, please use the timestamps to do so. Now let's find out what's really going on here. Sierra. After you. Hmm, now this looks interesting. Come on. What on earth? Wait. No. It can't be. That's John Caleb Bradburton! 
Or at least it's his head. Wow! Who... Who are you? I haven't seen a real human face in so long. I had given up all hope. Oh my god! It's alive! He's alive! My name's Sierra, sir. I'm your biggest admirer. I love Nuka-Cola more than anything. This is such an honor. You there, with the Pip-Boy. What are you doing here? We used the contest code to get in. What the hell happened to you? I made a devil's bargain, though I didn't know it at the time. This was General Braxton's plan all along. Damn the man. He called it Project Cobalt. In exchange for my weapon design, he would give me access to life-extending technology. I'm such a fool for taking him at his word. He never told me that this would be the price. Who was General Braxton? He was one of the top men in the Army Research Laboratory's Weapons and Materials Division. He'd taken a keen interest in my quantum mechanics research and offered me a trade. In exchange for my assistance on a top secret weapons project, he gave me access to an experimental process that would artificially extend my life. Like a fool, I leapt before I looked. I've certainly paid the price for my short-sightedness. A... Uh, a weapon? I don't believe it. Why would the genius who brought so much joy to the world want to make something destructive? Genius is restless, madam. It must expand, seek new challenges, and explore new frontiers. So yes, a weapon. It was going to be a quantum-enhanced variant of the standard portable tactical warhead. In fact, the prototypes are stored in this very chamber. You can have them on one condition. I want you to shut off the power to this machine that's keeping me alive. I want to die. What? No! Are you really sure that you want to... Die? I've had plenty of time to think about it. You can't kill him. He's a great man. He invented Nuka-Cola, the best thing in the world. Lady, you don't know what a torment it is. Being trapped here alone and staring at the same wall decade after decade. Now please shut up while I talk to your more rational friend here. I realize that what I'm asking isn't easy. But there's something in it for you. When the power is cut, the door to the prototype storage room will open automatically. Take anything you want. I don't care anymore. Just please, set me free at last. I can't bear this loneliness any longer. Wait, 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 wait. I have an idea. Mr. Brad Burton wants to die because he's lonely, right? Well, maybe I could stay with him, you know? Keep him company, give him someone to talk to. He's like a hero to me. Yeah, but if I don't cut the power, then that door doesn't open. And I don't get my prototype ammo. I know, I know, but I have something else that I can offer you instead. At least hear me out. I've got a limited edition Nuka-Cola jumpsuit. It's really stylish, and not many were made. It's one of my most treasured possessions, but... Well... I'm willing to let you have it. A Nuka-Cola jumpsuit? Ha! That's a paltry prize compared to what I'm offering. The choice is yours. But I beg you to honor my wishes. There is no one else who can help me. I sort of feel sorry for him. I couldn't stand being a frozen head. How could I drink Nuka-Cola? Sierra. I'm almost afraid to ask, but... What's your decision?
What about the secret Nuka-Cola formula you think is locked up in that vault? That was before we found John Caleb Bradburton in the flesh. Well, mostly. Who knows? Maybe he'll tell me the Nuka-Cola formula himself, along with all kinds of other things? <laughs> that would be incredible. Please, tell me that you'll let him live. I'm still thinking about it. Just please think carefully. If you shut off the power, there's no going back or changing your mind. So, have you made up your mind? What about Sierra's offer to keep you company? Wouldn't that help? I admit I'm flattered by her admiration, but I'm so tired in ways that words could not explain. I've lived far too long already, and I'm prepared to move on. I await your decision. I haven't decided yet. I see. I can only hope your sense of compassion compels you to do the right thing. I've been a prisoner long enough. Can you imagine being trapped like that for centuries? Please, think carefully. Don't rush your decision. I still so, feel sorry for him. Have you made up your mind? I'll do it. I'll shut off the power. Thank you. Now please do get on with it. I I'm ready. I've been ready for a long, long time. I couldn't stand being a frozen head. How could I drink Nuka-Cola? someone as smart as Mr. Bradburton would be fooled into thinking you could live forever. I guess he was terrified of growing old. You wanted the Nuka-Cola formula? Here it is. So it really was here. I'm grateful. But don't think this means I've forgiven you. You killed the man who was my greatest hero. A man who revolutionized the soft drink industry and whose creations put smiles on a million faces. Who the hell are you to just walk in here and destroy all that? I know you're disappointed, Sierra, but ask yourself, what was best for him? Well, maybe you're right. I guess I didn't consider his feelings as much as I should have. It's just that never, not in my wildest dreams, did I think... I'd get the chance to talk to Mr. Bradburton in person. To get an opportunity like that, and then have it snatched away. It hit me pretty hard. Still, I can't overlook the fact that for one glorious shining moment, I got to meet the man who invented Nuka-Cola. I'll never forget that. Not ever. And it wouldn't have been possible without your help. Thank you. Now that you've got the formula for Nuka-Cola, what are you gonna do with it? I'm not a chemist, but I might try to brew some up, just for fun. If that fails, well, I still got a new centerpiece for my collection. Here. I know it's not much, but... You really went above and beyond the Call of Duty. I think I'll stick around here for a while and see what else I can find. By the time I'm done, I'm gonna need a much bigger building to house my Nuka-Cola museum. Hey, Sierra. I wish you could have given me more time with Brad Burton before you cut the power. So in the end, after over two centuries, John Caleb Bradburton, creator, supposedly, of Nuka-Cola, was alive. 
preserve using state-of-the-art life support technology. Kind of a halfway point between the technology used to create a RoboBrain and the life support Robert House used in New Vegas. However, unlike RoboBrain technology, he lacks any mobility, and unlike Robert House, he doesn't seem to be able to network into various machines to control them. In fact, apart from the fact that he's still alive, this machine doesn't seem to do anything else for him. He blames Braxton for doing this, stating he suspects this was part of his plan all along. I have my doubts, and when we read some of the terminal entries down here, you'll see why. He asks us to switch off the life support that's keeping him alive, as he's apparently just had a view of the objects arrayed in front of him and the staircase for the last two centuries. He doesn't actually come out and say that no one has been down here in all this time, just that it's been a long time. However, I think it's a safe assumption that, besides us, not a single soul has spoken to him in all this time. If that is the case, it's actually pretty incredible he hasn't gone insane yet. This could be a testament to his supposed incredible intellect, or the machine in some ways staves off the effects isolation would have on him. Additionally, when you go to talk to him, it says activate, not talk. This may mean that he can go into his sleep or some other sort of state, and just let time pass him by until someone enters his vault. We just don't know. If we choose to let him die, we can see the fruits of the research the beverage years conducted. We get access to the enhanced Minidux, and we can also find the formula for Nuka Cola. Apart from these two things, there's precious little else in this vault. No large amount of gold bars or anything interesting like that. Sierra wants to keep him alive and discover his secrets, to learn more about him. As to her, he's a hero. A giant. But then, some of her dialogue when she's just near us states she couldn't stand being a frozen head, so she does seem to be aware that he's suffering and he wants to let go. In the end, I chose to let him die, partly because I think it's the moral choice, partly because I want the goods. You can scold her when she gets shitty about it because, let's be honest, she's pretty much arguing for someone to be kept alive just so she can feel good and get what she wants. She isn't considering how he feels or the awful situation he's been in for over two centuries. He may be an asshole and possibly a total fraud, as we'll discuss, but he didn't deserve this. You don't really get any new information if you choose to keep him alive, so I won't be showing that in this video. The last thing to take a look at down here is the room to the left of Bradburton. It is here we can get some information on just where his success may have came from, and on Lee Bex. All these entries can be found on Bradburton's project terminal. The first few entries are in acquisitions, and it's here that I think the curtain gets drawn back a little on Bradburton. The first entry is called Merrill's Very Cherry Soda, a soda originally owned by Merrill Haverston. It was relaunched as the cherry flavour of the cola. They did minor modifications to the formula, and then just slapped it together and added some colour. So right there, we have confirmation that this, and as we shall see, three more drinks were not original creations. Kind of calls into question the competency of the beverage ears, or at least it would if not for Quantum. But let's keep going. The next is Grape Pearl Soda, and was originally owned by Joni Sheng, if I am saying that right. It was resold as a grape variant, and apparently the original was only sold overseas, given the name. This suggests it was the Asian market. This is surprising, given either the tensions or all-out war at the time. Then again, we know Brad Burton had pull with the military, so maybe he sidestepped that. The only change seems to have been to get the price down, which is just typical. Second last is Sharon's Down Home Country Lemon. Original owner, Sharon Lawrence. Now this entry's a little odd. This was the clear variant we heard about in the holotape on Brad Burton's desk. It was delayed due to Brad Burton wanting to go with Quantum instead, and because they also had another upcoming lemon-lime flavoured drink. So this doesn't really make sense to me as an acquisition, outside perhaps of getting rid of the competition. They also needed to use cheaper ingredients. The final one is called Pack Full of Joe. It's the only one where the owner didn't slap their own name on it, a William Lee in this case, not Joe, which is a reference to coffee. The variant is a coffee-flavoured cola. Sounds fucking dreadful, and the notes confirm this when they try and mix it. And let's be honest here. You don't need to mix two drinks that people only really enjoy the flavours of, due to the various addictive properties of their constituent parts. We'll talk about why I think these entries mean that Brad Burton wasn't as brilliant as he claimed to be, later. The last set of entries is all to do with Project Cobalt. The reason it's still called Project Cobalt, despite the research being done by the beverage years, is that the procedure done to Brad Burton was part of the deal. It was the true hidden goal, at least for him, of the project. The first entry is on the 17th of March, 
2076, the day Braxton came to his office, which then gives us a rough date for that holotape recording. This means that all this occurred over a period of just one year and seven months. He knew Braxton was coming to him, as he seems to have used his contacts in Washington to either arrange it, or he had enough forewarning to predict what he was going to ask, and what he could get in return. We learn that Leapback stands for life extension and prolongation. I wonder how long it took to come up with that name. He, like Robert House, seems to have known where the world was headed, though I have to wonder if he knew for as long as House did, as he clearly didn't have as much set up to prepare for it. Also, House made plans to prepare for what came after, while Brad Burton just wanted to survive it. The entry after this takes place over five months later, on the 27th of August. This seems to be after he had his personal vault put in, as it needed to be modified to accommodate the technology that Leapax required. He deals with the huge costs by funneling away money from the park, which is surprising as the hardware we see doesn't seem that extensive, so either it's just far more advanced on the inside, or there's a lot more that we don't see. Regardless, this is likely the reason why so many divisions of the park reported issues with personnel and supplies. Corners were being cut and resources were being diverted so Brad Burton could power this machine. The military likely would have provided funding and resources for the weapons development, so the money that was diverted to the project must have been, at least in part, so he could secretly power all of this. He even brought in some of the military researchers to oversee the project directly, to make sure it all went smoothly. October 20th, 2076 is the next entry. It takes place after the Beveridgeers found success with Strontium-90. They've already developed some prototypes, which honestly seem to function exactly as intended, given the point was enhancing the mini nukes in the first place. Moreover, this seems to confirm that the quantum power armor we obtain in Galactic Zone was indeed enhanced with quantum, not just so named as a promotional piece. Although I have to wonder how this was actually achieved. I assume it was the power source, as nothing they said about the compound would suggest it would increase the durability of metals. Then again, it still just uses fusion cores, so I'm not sure exactly what was enhanced. He also states that Meacham thinks they can use it to create a soft drink with a longer glow than Quartz or Victory, which we now know is the quantum drink. This places this entry somewhere around Meacham's third one in the user logs at the lab. Also note, it's just over a year before the bombs were dropped, which tells us the conception, development, testing, and distribution had to have happened in less time than that. Probably several months less, which tells us how little they really tested it on people. What's also odd is Meachin said he was told to call a quantum at the meeting where Brad Burton was supposedly too sick to attend. He hasn't underwent the procedure yet, so either this entry is misdated, there's been a mistake somewhere, or Meachin wasn't told this for a while. It could be he was already sequestering himself in preparation for the procedure, as he did get Peyton to clear his schedule for the next year and a half. But that seemed to be to devote time to Project Cobalt, and this would have fallen under that. The second last entry is on the 19th of January, 2077, and all is not well. Apparently Leapax has not progressed as far as planned, and the original idea of a biosuit one could walk around in while it preserved you simply isn't feasible. They can only preserve about 15 pounds of organic matter, or by the average adult head. He decides to go ahead and do it, and this explains his current state. Now, I'll be honest, I don't really understand why, if he knew how much it cost to keep the machinery running, and how much was needed in the first place, he thought he was getting a biosuit. I mean, did they show one to him at some point? He said his people were looking over the machinery and the data as well, and he had actual Leapax technicians down here. So did they all lie to him about what the machinery was for? And for that matter, what did he think it was for in the first place? Some sort of process that he thought only needed to occur once, and then you'd, what, live forever? This, to me, is one of the biggest knocks to the genius persona he has, as it just seems like a huge oversight, and if he was the scientist he claims to be, he should have figured it out. He had full access to all the data, machinery, scientists, and he knew about the project beforehand, yet he still acts like it's all a big surprise. It seems to me like he should have went with another immortality play. His final entry, and the last piece of information we need to look at, is an entry that took place on the 2nd of April, 2077. He's undergoing the surgical procedure to have his head removed from his body, and placed inside the system he near ran his theme park into the ground to keep in operation. Apart from himself and the actual Leapax engineers, Peyton is the only other person who knows what's going on, which is pretty unbelievable given how well known this guy was. Perhaps he was just so sure of how soon the end of the world was coming that he figured no one would have time to figure it out. Now this does occur about six months before the bombs dropped. This would seem like it would be the half a year part of his schedule that Peyton cleared out, as stated before, 
he could have just been keeping out of the public eye, or perhaps he was genuinely sick. However, the entry in his terminal regarding the Cappy contest states he can still meet with him if he hasn't undergone the procedure yet. All I can conclude is that the entries either weren't in order, were very close together, so the procedure happened shortly after, or the six months really weren't for after the procedure. The problem then is, what was the plan when it succeeded? If he still had access to outside systems, he would not need Peyton to keep coming down here every day and keep him informed. This implies that he was just planning to disappear from the public eye, with no explanation for how he disappeared. No mention is made of him stepping down, or faking his death. What also has to be considered is whether Peyton actually kept coming down here. I feel like it would have come up in conversation if he had turned around and betrayed Brad Burton. This means that at some point, his confidant, and perhaps his friend, just never turned up again. Maybe before the bombs, maybe after, but from that point on, he was left down here, staring out at a very sparse room, isolated with nothing but his ego. Two final things to talk about are him possibly being a total fraud, and whether Braxton planned all of this. My argument for him being a fraud, or at least not as smart as he makes himself out to be, comes from three things. He didn't understand the limitations of Lee Bex. He claimed the quantum research as his own, when it wasn't, and at least some of the more recent flavors of cola were taken from competitors. I've already outlined why I think it's strange that he didn't understand the limitations of Lee Bex. Yes, he could have been desperate, and just ignored or overlooked whatever didn't suit him. But I think another possibility is he simply didn't understand the technology, at least not enough to know what he was getting. When Sierra expresses horror at him making weapons, he goes on about genius needing to seek new challenges, but it was the beverage years the military wanted, not him. Additionally, as far as I can tell, all the research was conducted by them. Brad Burton had fuck all to do with it, yet he still talks about it being his research and refers to genius. Now maybe he meant the beverage years, but I feel like he was talking about himself. Lastly, even they weren't wholly responsible for their success, as the corporation was clearly just buying up other sodas and emulating them. Yes, this is how competition is sometimes done, but then I have to wonder if he was even responsible for the ones not listed in the terminal, or even the original formula. Perhaps I just hold him in too low a regard, as he got himself stuck in his own vault, but I think the man is overhyped. Now as for him making a devil's bargain, I'm kind of on the fence about it. On the one hand, he states in his terminal entries that his contacts either told him Braxton was coming to see him, and what for, or they outright persuaded the man. If the latter is true, then I doubt he planned to do this to Brad Burton. If it was the former, he could have been aware he was being watched, and used his own contacts to determine what Brad Burton was keeping an eye on, Lee Bex. Now even then, Brad Burton is still the one who made the choice to get his hands in the technology, and to only have his head taken, when they told him over two months before that it could only be the head. It's not like they lied, said they could do it all, and then he woke up like this. Really, the only way Braxton could have done this is if he somehow arranged the information to be leaked to Brad Burton, who was looking for life extension tech. If he did do this, then he either wanted to test the tech, get funding for it, or he knew it was a dead end, and wanted to take out Brad Burton for some reason. Maybe to get his hands in the technology he was going to get him to develop easier. Really, we may never know, as they both seem pretty arrogant. Brad Burton could just be trying to act like he was played, so he doesn't have to admit how badly he shit the bed. So in order to stave off death, John Caleb Brad Burton, the man that created, supposedly, the cola whose constituent components would become the backbone of the post-fallout economy, stuck his head in a jar and trapped himself under the ground, like a dickhead. Sierra Petrovita, a character from Fallout 3, first sets us on the trail by getting us to track down the hidden copies clues that are part of a competition to get you into Brad Burton's office so you could meet the man himself. Brad Burton had made a deal with General Braxton of the US military, in exchange for his team of organic chemists, the beverage years, making enhancements to existing weaponry, Brad Burton would get access to Leapex. This was an experimental piece of technology, originally marketed as a biosuit, that would allow him to extend his life. Avoiding the end of the world, he correctly predicted, was coming. He held up his end of the deal, with the beverage years making a breakthrough with Strontium 90, creating quantum. This was to be applied to existing weaponry, specifically mini nukes, to enhance their potency. As we saw in the World of Refreshment video, Rex managed to also create grenades that utilize quantum as well. However, his overall drive to finish the work was still unnecessary, as far as I'm concerned. He achieved what they set out to do. Along with the weaponry, they also created an additive for Nuka Cola causing it to glow a lot longer than their other existing flavors. This occurred about a year before the bombs dropped, 
Now whether Brad Burton's entries occurred before or after Rex's, we can't be sure, as Rex didn't date his, but we know that Quantum was launched before the bombs dropped, and that further tweaking and testing was done at DC, and then also under Kate's supervision. Given this, on top of the overall development and the actual release, we can assume that Kate's delay of 68 months never happened, which honestly tracks given what we know about this company. After this, Brad Burton underwent the procedure to only have his head preserved, given the limitations of Leapex. He seems to have stocked his vault with quite a few personal items. However, I wonder if these were already here, and he never stopped to think what he'd do once the procedure was done and he was stuck. I also have to wonder if, after the procedure was finished, did he try and have it reversed, or get revenge on Braxton in some way. It could be that he was satisfied with what he had done until the isolation after the bombs dropped began to get to him. Centuries later, after finding the hidden copies and the button in his office, we can descend into his own personal vault and find John Caleb Bradburton in all of his glory, trapped in a glass tube, looking out at the same room filled with mementos of his success. After all of this time, he is ready to die, and it's up to us to choose between giving him his peace or keeping him alive for the sake of a raving fan. I chose the former, but maybe you would do it differently, regardless of your choice. What is clear is that, after 200 years, this titan of industry is a broken man, worn away by centuries of isolation, regretting the deal he had made that he put so much of his resources and fortune into. In the end, just another example of how cheating death never turns out the way you want it to.